Well, good evening, folks. How are those things going for you? Trying to finish up uh, this series called uh, The Secret Solve, a look at uh, Byron Price's book, The Secret. I've been doing these uh, presentations on what I can learn about the back of the book and the front of the book. And I'm on uh, I'm on page, one, on page 107 now. And we're talking about the culture vultures, uh, otherwise known as the, the Patronia Martimonia Alimonia. Uh, so, uh, the culture vultures, who are they? Well, uh, there's a, several cues that can be given in the uh, article itself. But uh, the fact that we know that one of the uh, secret masks was in the Cleveland R uh, Rockefeller uh, Cultural Gardens, we can probably lay claim to the idea that probably this has a little bit to do with the Rockefellers. And indeed, I think it does. Because um, if you look at Abby Aldrich Rockefeller, uh, uh, the, she has a sculpture garden at the Mo Museum of Modern Art. And you may wonder, well, why is there a sculpture garden at the MoMA? Well, it's because uh, Abby Green Aldrich was born in 1874 in Providence, Rhode Island, the fourth uh, child of Nelson Aldrich, a successful business, business, businessman who at the turn of the century had become the most powerful Republican in the Senate. <clears throat> uh, she ended up uh, meeting and marrying uh, the Rockefeller guy. Uh, <clears throat> and she took the uh, responsibility of her husband's inheritance Seriously. In other words, she was a patronia, matrimonia, alimonia. <laughs> uh, so they met at Brown University, which is, they had a seven year courtship. Uh, anyway, uh, so, uh, her, <clears throat> um, so she uh, contributed to a range of social causes from the YWCA. Uh, to uh, helping uh, with one of the first women's hotels, and uh, she helped the Girl Scouts. But her legacy is more or less tied to the Museum of Modern Art in New York, which she co-founded with two other women, Lily Bliss and Mary Quinn Sullivan. Uh, and it's at the uh, West 54th uh, Street uh, is where this is located at. So Lily Bliss, uh, otherwise known as Lily Plummer Bliss, was born in 1864 in Boston as a daughter of a textile merchant, uh, Cornelius Newton Bliss, and uh, Mary Elizabeth uh, uh, born Plummer. Anyway, uh, so uh, here she is, daughter of the United States Secretary of the Tent. Uh, and she was uh, basically an American art collector and patron. And she went to the armory shows, and uh, it was her uh, 150 works of art that uh, formed the basis of the Museum of Modern Art's collection. And uh, she built, uh, you know, this collection uh, over time. So there you go, Lily Bliss. Mary, uh, Mary Quinn... Um, Sullivan uh, is the other co-founder of MoMA. Uh, she was in a, a born in Indianapolis, Indiana, uh, and she had a little group of people that she kind of hung out with there. Uh, and she was hired as a teacher in Queens. Uh, and, it's, and then she went to Europe, and uh, then she married uh, Cornelius Sullivan, Sol, uh, Sullivan, and he was a prominent New York lawyer. Again, Patronia, Matrimonia, Alimonia. In other words, um, school teacher marries rich man, suddenly becomes a patron of the arts. <laughs> After her marriage, she became a strong supporter of philanthropic causes. Of course! She served as the president of the Needle and Bobbin Club in New York City. Oh, the Space Needle? Out in, anyway. Uh, the women's group sold lace work for charity uh, and, and helped the, the uh, poorhouse on Blackwell's Island. 
Ooh, Blackwell's Island. Mm, mm, don't get too excited about that. Uh, but anyway, so she uh, she be, uh, became a, one of the people that helped found the Indianapolis Museum of Art, too, uh, through her uh, uh, relationship with the Gambroilers. Okay, so that's uh, Mary Sullivan. Uh, she opened a gallery at East 50th Street, at 6th Street, New York City, uh, at close to Park Avenue. Uh, so uh, she died in uh, Queens, New York uh, in 1939. Uh, okay, so there's the MoMA connection to these uh, uh, art patrons, patrons, uh, cultural uh, references. Uh, a couple of other things that were mentioned in this article was the, the idea of 12-tone technique, also, is no, also known as Dota Caffoni, 12-tone serialism, or 12-note uh, composition. And uh, this leads you to the second Vien Viennese school, uh, and it's a way in which notes are arranged and... Uh, the most noted composers in this genre are Arnold uh, Schoenberg, and uh, in the uh, area that might be most of interest to us is, uh, you know, composers like uh, Igor Stravinsky. And this was often uh, the way in which the music and cartoons uh, was were presented. And so, like uh, 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 Tom and Jerry's uh, short uh, "Putting on the Dog." Uh, in 1940 and 1944 uh, 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 is an example of how these uh, 12-note tone uh, were used um, in this. Uh, so uh, we talked about that one. So op art is the other uh, thing that was mentioned here as a as a an op art, short for optical art, is a style of visual art that uses optical illusions. So, you know, we've got all of these checkerboard uh, designs. Well, one of the uh, uh, one of the uh, early artwork pieces in this was called a movement in squares, and it was by uh, Bridget uh, Louise Riley. Uh, and Bridget Louise Riley <laughs> is a, is an English uh, uh, lady painter uh, from Cornwall <laughs> area of France. So again, we've got a, another Cornwall here, uh, Bridget. And so maybe maybe that image with all of those squares and those cubes in it, are just about Bridget Louise Riley's work. Um, and uh, uh, so, I don't know. That's just kind of interesting. Uh, she was a nurse to her father. Oh, a nurse to her father. Well, that makes sense because um, it had to be that way because one of these actual mentioned, like the Aranus, is a fairy of the nurses? I see now. Or maybe that's the Menads, which is the uh, fairy of the nurses. So maybe that's the confirmation of which fairies we're talking about. Um, so we t we're talking about uh, the, uh, um, the op art and the origins of op art. The only three, uh, the other thing left here is Martha Jackson Kellogg. And she was an American art dealer, gallery owner, and collector. Her New York-based Martha Gallery was founded in 1953. Was its it was groundbreaking in its representation of representation of women and international art artists, and it established the op art movement. And Jackson was born Martha Kellogg in Buffalo, New York, uh, and she was and that was a prominent family of uh, Serena Case and Howard. Kellogg. Uh, the company that uh, used to be theirs was eventually bought by Textron in uh, 1961, and Textron became a huge conglomerate. Is a huge conglomerate. Uh, she actually has some time in Baltimore, 
Uh, but uh, again, uh, she died at 62 in Los Angeles in, in 1969. Uh, uh, she was in her swimming pool when it happened. Um, so she's known for the Martha Jackson Gallery, which kind of helped establish this op art uh, uh, craze. Uh, the other one is I bring Mary Shelley, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley into this because of the uh, poetry of her husband, Percy Shelley, and the possibility that there's some slight uh, uh, correspondence here with the idea of the theater of cruelty. So this theater of cruelty, if you look up that, is this interesting, um, uh, I don't know, surrealism. Uh, what is this? Uh, the theater of the cruelty is, is mentioned and this, this is basically, uh, it was developed by a guy by the name of Antonian Archod, and it's aimed to shock audiences through gesture, image, and sound and lighting. Uh, and uh, so the Wikipedia on this, you know, means that, you know, it's French in origin. Uh, the theory is that it's a primitive ceremonial experience intended to liberate the human subconscious and real, reveal man to himself uh so there's a whole bunch of things you can talk about when it comes to this uh but i don't know who the actual patrons of this were it just mentions that our trot only produced one play uh that put the theories of theater to cruelty in practice he staged uh and directed less les sensi less sensi adapted from the dramatic work of the same title by Percy Shelley. And so if Theater of Cruelty uh, has much to do with this article, it's got to have to do with this one play uh, that Percy Shelley um, uh, basically pr provided a production of. And uh, so... Uh, there's some of the stuff about uh, what I, I consider to be the uh, um, interesting stuff. Um, so uh, the the only interesting anecdote that I'm going to add to this is that you can look up all of these uh, Furies, Maenads, and the Orpheus and get into the whole Greek tragedy, you know, what those represent. Uh, the golden fleece and, and all of that and somebody's wife dying from a snake bite um, and the harpy of, co of course is a half human and half bird and we know that the, 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 the minotaur was a half man half horse and so um, the culture vulture again rears its head there uh, speaking of bats and heads on bats my last Fun fact is that on January 20th, 1982, Oz, Ozzy Osbourne bit the head off of a bat at, in uh, Des Moines, Iowa at a uh, concert. And so there you go. There's your bat reference right there. Uh, I actually kind of thought that the head in that bat uh, sitting on page uh, 106. At one time, the 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 106 image, uh, I I thought for sure that was Ozzy Osbourne. I could have swore that was Ozzy Osbourne in there. And uh, you know, Ozzy famously bit the head off of a of a of a bat. And the only reason I'm saying that is uh, uh, it says that uh, the it, the uh, uh, it has been conjectured that they travel from place to place on quote. Old bat wings, <laughs> old bats, you know, old bat wings. Uh, oh, bat wings. Maybe that's a maybe that's a reference to Batman. I don't know. I don't have much luck with the culture vultures. Other than that, this is probably a direct relation to uh, Rockefeller's wife uh, and the founding of MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art. I, I think that's the takeaway on this one. Now that we know that one of them was found at the cultural gardens. All right, folks. Live streaming. Hey, Jeff, how's it going? Talking about the culture vultures now. Well, 
I think I've about done everything I can about the vultures. Unfortunately, there's no human face in this one other than that on the on the the bat sitting on the lily pad. And I swear that's Ozzy Osbourne. Um, but I'm not sure. It could be whoever. But it definitely looks like there's an airplane falling off. Uh, so anyway, all right, folks. I'll uh, I don't know if I'm gonna do another one tonight, but I think that's all I got for the culture vultures. So uh, we'll talk to you later.